Amen. So with the reason we're looking at this weird book called Malachi, or Malachi, it's, I think it's more like Malachi, but you know, um, is because we've been doing a five-week series in the Minor Prophets. Can you say Minor Prophets? Some of you have no idea what they are. They're not less important, but they're a bunch of uh, Old Testament books uh, that are shorter than some of the others. And these are prophets, people who spoke God's message to God's people on his behalf and kind of diagnosed what was going on with God's people. And Malachi is the last book of what we would read as the Old Testament. Chronologically, it's the last book as well. And so after this book, there were 400 years of silence from God. God didn't speak to his people for another 400 years after this until Jesus came on the scene. And one could say that if you like a, if you like a quick summary of the Old Testament, anyone on blink list, they give you 15 minute summaries of every book you could ever want to imagine. You don't have to read it. You can just watch the summary. Some would say that Malachi is a 15 minute summary of most of the themes from the Old Testament that you can find in the book of Malachi. And it's written about 150, 170 years after God's people had been taken into Babylon in exile. And after 70 years, they were returned. And the reason I tell you that is because for some of you, the only reference point you have for that is the great Boney M song. Who knows it? By the rivers of. And we remembered Zion. That was the song of God's people in Babylon. Well, they were waiting to go back to their home city. And they did get back. And um, if you know biblical names, you then had people like Nehemiah and Ezra who helped God's people go back from exile. And they started their spiritual life again in their Zion, their place of home. And they made some great reforms. It was great spiritual life because they'd been away from home physically and spiritually And so they had these great reforms you can read about in the book of Nehemiah, and they they put it down in writing. So we read in Nehemiah 9, verse 38, in view of all of this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. So they're like, we're making a real commitment, yeah, and here are some of the expressions of their commitment from Nehemiah that Malachi is going to pick up. So... In Nehemiah 10, they said, we will give God our first and our best. In Nehemiah 10.30, they said, we will honor God with our marriages. We're not going to intermarry with unbelievers outside of Israel. Nehemiah 10.37 to 39, it says, we will put God's temple first with our tithes and offerings. So those are some of the resolutions that they made when they returned and their spiritual life was at a bit of a a zenith and they had come back to God and they said, we're going to give God our, our best and our first in every single way. But by the time we get to Malachi, it's maybe been a generation or so, things hadn't sustained, things hadn't gone so well. They were disappointed with God. Can you say disappointed? Disappointed. Have you ever been disappointed with God? If you've been a Christian for very long, it's something that you'll have to wrestle with in your heart, disappointment with God. Maybe here today you are in the midst of disappointment with God. He hasn't done what you thought he would do. You're still waiting. In fact, there's no hope anymore because that person has died and not been healed or that relationship has been severed and people have moved on and you think, I'm just disappointed with God and you've braved walking into church today. Maybe you've been hurt by church. Welcome to human people that happens. And maybe you've been disappointed with church. You think, I brave to walk in and no one spoke to me and everyone was very unfriendly. In fact, I've got told off. We've all been there. And this is where Malachi picks up. God's people are very disappointed with him, deeply disappointed with him. In fact, the book of Malachi is six charges of God against his people. And their responses are, why, what, how, when? So God is saying, this is what's going on. And they say, no, 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 it's not us, God. It's, it's you. You haven't kept up your end of the bargain, we've kept up our end of the bargain. If you want to summarize much of the Old Testament wrestle, in fact, the wrestle in your heart, and particularly the book of Malachi, you read in Malachi 3 verse 7, ever since the time of your ancestors, God speaks through Malachi, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. Can you say return? And I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. 
And the people at the time were like, you return to you return to us. <laughs> We've returned to you. We are doing all the right things. But in reality, as I said, the spiritual life had actually worn off, but they were still doing all the religious trappings. Okay? So they were still doing all the right things. They looked really spiritual. They went to church. They went to life group every week. They gave money very flamboyantly. Whatever it is that you think is a spiritual veneer, you know, every conversation was like, if it's God's will. Now, that's a good attitude to have, but you don't have to say every time, although it's okay if you do, but sometimes people say, if it's God's will, and then they walk away and never think about God's will ever again. They had emphasized doing the right thing, but their hearts were totally gone. In fact, these are the kind of people that Jesus in the New Testament called whitewashed tombs. Jesus didn't have a problem speaking the truth in love because he wanted people to return to him. And until we see our problems, we don't see the need to return, do we? So rather than being deeply spiritual, they're actually just trying to manipulate God. Okay, So they were saying, we're doing all the right things. We're talking all the right boxes. We're going to the temple, blah, blah, blah. And you're not holding up what you, well, at least what we thought you would do, God. So they were deeply disappointed, and they were saying, God, we need to return to you. No, 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 no. You need to return to us. And what God does, and what we're going to do through this letter, is God says to them, it's all makeup. <laughs> it's all makeup. You look like you're being spiritual, but you're just putting on your makeup. In reality, he says, you're not God first, you're self first. Can you say self first? Self, and this is the first charge that God gives them. You are self first, not God first. Now, I just want to say a comment here. If you're not a follower of Jesus, what the Bible speaks to and the commands and the calls in the Bible are calls to people who have said Jesus is Lord. If you have no, never claimed to follow Jesus, no one's expecting you to live as if you have. But what you get to do is you get to look in and you think, why would God call people to do that? And why would people live like that? Oh, look at that. They give everything. There must be something behind this. So that's the call of the Bible. It's not, necessarily, it's not saying that it's not wrong, but no one's asking you to live up to a standard because here's a little secret. You can't. <laughs> that's why we're Christians, because we've realized we can't and we need God's help. So these are primarily written to the followers of God and the normal expectation for the followers of God, but it's an invitation to others to come in and join that as well. So he says, you're self first people, not God first people. So remember Nehemiah chapter 10, where we said, they said, we will give God our first and our best. Malachi chapter one, we read this. God speaking to them through Malachi. And you say, what a burden. So they bring in all their temple offerings, the veneer of spirituality, but it's all makeup. But actually they're saying, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, doing all the right things, but contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared amongst the nations. What's going on here? Well, they were called to give their first and their best to God uh, for a myriad of reasons because God's worthy of it. But actually, those sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus, who was the first and best given by God. That's why they were to be without blemish. But instead of giving God their first and their best, they were giving God the leftovers. They were giving the injured and the lame and the diseased animals. It looked good because they would go to the temple carrying their animal to give it to the temple for the sacrifices, and it would be brushed well, groomed, all nice and smelly, perfume as you would these days. But underneath was brokenness and disease and lameness. It didn't actually cost them anything, but they called it sacrificial worship. What does God get from you, from me? Does he get our first and our best, or does he get our leftovers? Does he get from us that which costs us? Do we live a life that is sacrificial in giving God our first and our best? C.S. Lewis suggests that when it comes to giving in whatever arena of life, time, energy, money, capacity, he has like one rule. 
is that it should alter his lifestyle to the point where if you took an unbeliever and a believer who were on a similar resource scale, income or whatever it might be, and their lives were the same, something would be amiss. Because the Christian should be giving sacrificially of their first and their best. So if an unbeliever on the same level of resource as a, as a believer of God live in exactly the same way with no impact on their lives, C.S. Lewis would say there are questions to be asked. What do you do with unexpected benefits that you get? Suddenly with your time or your money or whatever it might be. Is your question a self-first question or is it a God-first question? Is it, oh, I can now do this. Now, the outcome might be the same. Or do you think, God, you've given me this, what shall I do with it? The main thing is the heart and the question. The result might be exactly the same. Students, when you choose what to study, or you think about your career progression, have you stopped to think what would serve God best? Or are you on the treadmill of what will make me the most money, what's naturally expected of me? Now, the fact that you're studying what you are probably means your gifts and talents point that way, and you might end up doing exactly the same thing, but is the first and best question, what can I give God? I have free time. God, I want to give you my first and best. What will that look like for me? Maybe we're coming to um, retirement, and we are thinking that great Western phrase, me time. Actually, I want to down all responsibilities and I'm just going to holiday and enjoy some me time for the next however many years. Now, don't worry about getting the jitters. None of these things are wrong <laughs> necessarily, okay? But if our heart is not a God first question and it's a self first question, are we that far away from what's happening here? Are we giving God what's left after we've just decided what we want to do? I'm preaching this to you, yes, and I'm preaching it to me very much so. So for me, and this has <laughs> happened a lot in my life, if I don't have my time with the Lord and I don't give him my first and best literally in the day, he ends up being squeezed in in the margins around the day. And I try and read a, like a two-minute devotional when I'm falling asleep in my bed or something like that. I, I, I realize some of you are night owls, okay? So it's okay that way. But if I don't give God my first and best of the day, no matter how much I have tried personally, he ends up being squeezed in the margins of my life. Is God getting the first and best of your time, of your energy, your attention, your focus, your affection? Questions that this scripture asks of us. And then it's, it's, it's squeaky bum time, okay? Some of the, these scriptures, uh, there's no fluff here, is there? Okay, this is just God calling you to return to him. This is what it is, because these things draw our hearts away from him. So remember Nehemiah in the day they resolved about their marriages, just to say, we'll be faithful in our marriages. We won't marry the foreigners. But divorce and chasing foreign women has now begun to characterize the people of God. So in Malachi 2, 13 to 15, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altars with tears. You weep and wail because God no longer looks on your offerings with favor, and you ask, why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Much to say on this, this could be a whole series. But in short, what's happening is people have resolved to give God their best and to be faithful in their marriage covenant and not to pursue foreign women, right? And here God's saying, you're wondering why your spiritual veneer isn't being fruitful when actually you're being unfaithful in many other ways. People were divorcing their wives because they're like the attractive foreign women or they were simply marrying foreign women because they were asking a self first question not a god first question in fact most if not all and don't hear what i'm not saying i'm not saying there's never reason for separation or divorce that's not what i'm saying another sermon altogether that's the it's the, it's the challenge of preaching you want to answer every question that's popping up in your hearts and minds now that's for another time but for now he's saying hey actually you're thinking about yourself What's going to attract me most? What's going to complete me more? What's going to satisfy me more? Who's going to meet my needs? Who will complete 
me rather than saying, God first, marriage is not about me. Marriage is about God. God's faithfulness to us. God's perseverance to us. God's kindness to us. God's forgiving us. You see, you, you've got to fall in love with marriage if you want to have a fruitful marriage. You've got to fall in love with what marriage is. It's a proclamation of the gospel of how good and faithful and kind and patient and persevering God is. It's not simply about me and my needs and what I get. Another thing here, what does God want in, in marriage? Godly offspring. One of the prime purposes of marriage is to have children who are raised as disciples of Jesus who proclaim God's glory to the world. Lots of things I would like to preach on. And what I don't mean doesn't mean you all have to have children. There are many God-honoring reasons to not have children. Some of you long to have children and you cannot. But what I am saying is we live in a time where people say, should I get a dog or have a child? As if it's an accessory in our lives. The more self-centered a community gets, the less children they have. Surprise, surprise, children are inconvenient. I love you guys, my children. Children are costly, are they not? If your reason for not having children is a self-first reason, there are questions to be asked. Marriages tend to generally fail because people are self-first people. So I come from a line of broken marriages in my wife's family as well. And there are many other reasons that are out of one's control. And marriage can be beautiful and God-glorifying when it's wonderful. When there's, have you met those couples? They just seem to click. Their interests are the same. They love each other incessantly. And they just like, they really are soulmates. Have you met some of them? God bless you if that's you. Abundantly, have you or are you in marriage that at times takes selfless love, perseverance, relentless forgiveness, is filled with misunderstanding and conflict? You can glorify God in such a marriage as that. Now, listen, it's the pastor and he wants to preach a whole bunch of other stuff, okay? It, Take counsel and wisdom if you're in an unhealthy marriage. There might be a reason for separation or other things, okay? That's, I'm not speaking directly to that. But what I am saying is most marriage is less fruitful and disintegrates because of self-firstness rather than God-firstness. So God says to them, you're self-first, not God-first people. J.D. Greer says this, he says, Our offerings towards God ought to make a statement to the nations, other people, about God's worth to us. People should say, wow, you honor God that much that you should make that kind of sacrifice. Who is this God and why do you feel this way about him? Historians would say one of the reasons Christianity exploded in the early days was because when there were plagues and sicknesses, Christians made the sacrifice of their lives to go in and care for people where no one else would. Something about the sacrifice of Christians should cause the world to look in and wonder, and why the heck do you do that? So a little example for us, family, is at Sunday activities. I love my sports. I play hockey. I'm in pain today from it yesterday. The guy said, why don't you bring your son to hockey every week? Well, guess what day hockey is? Guess what day most kids' sports is? Sunday. Teams. And so we have to have this discussion with our kids. Well, it's the same time as church. Now, one day we might have five services a day at multiple times, and you can do both. Hallelujah. But right now, I send my kids to hockey and don't prioritize church, and then one day when they leave home and go to university, they don't prioritize Jesus and the church. Now, it's not that they never go. Don't hear me this. And every parent makes a very different decision. Uh, uh, you know, once in a while we have this discussion. Usually we say yes for a close friend. Or once in a while, even today, our, our younger son is actually at a party today, but he was here for the beginning of worship. And do you know what happened? The people said, we would love him to come to our son's birthday, but we know it's a church day and it'll be hard for you. But we could come to church and pick him up. And so I, I'm not waving that as a proud flag thing, but I said, at, at last, some impact. <laughs> you think our kids pay a price and they're aware of that. And sometimes it's hard and we have a discussion with them. But now our son's gone and someone's come to church and they know that we're at church and that he might not have gone because of Jesus and we're trusting it will make some kind of 
impact. That's how it works out for us. So there's no rules. Don't make rules on these things. You know, their witness is important as well. But we should make a statement to the world. Wouldn't you come on a sun holiday with us? Oh, I would love to, but no. But we have on the same income and our mortgage is the same. Yes, but I give to the Lord Jesus first and best. Thousands of pounds a year. What? And I can't go on the sun holiday. You're crazy. Absolutely. Crazily in love with Jesus and what he's done for me. This is an invitation for us to come into this fullness of love. Why do billions of people put God first when it costs them their lives? Why do billions of people, why, why is the church in Iran under persecution growing faster than anywhere else? Why is the church in China under persecution flourishing almost at the same rates, if not more? Because many people over the years, even though Christians have wrestled with putting makeup on, the church has got it wrong, they have wrestled their hearts to put God first. And have found he is the most satisfying, he is the most faithful, he is the most comforting, he is the most healing one you could ever put your trust in. And he is the only one whose hope goes beyond the grave. My son came home the other day and he said to me, that way, he said to my wife actually, how can we trust the Bible? It's just like any other religious book. Like, okay, great question, son. Where do we go with this? And I said to him, son, first and foremost, there is faith, but I can tell you I've met the Jesus of the Bible. And the Bible tells me about him, and I've met him, and it's absolutely true because it's, I've met him. And then, son, yes, the Bible lives up to any other historical history book you can have. By whatever you rate your history books, reliability, the Bible knocks the socks off them. You can go look for it for yourself, even from non-Christian scholars. There are lots of reasons to believe the Bible beyond faith or before faith. But we know it because we've met the person who's written it and we say the two are the, two are the same. So God says you're a self first, not a God first people. And he keeps going. Are you comfortable? Smile. It's okay. He keeps going. And he says, you're a self-dependent, not God-trusting people. Can you say self-dependent? He pulls no punches here because God's not trying to point out fault. He's trying to wrestle their hearts to truly come back to him and say, don't do this makeup worship. Let's talk about the heart and what's really going on inside. And now we're going to address our direct resource, which is money. Can you say money? money. All right. It only gets more uncomfortable, okay? Money. What we do with it... What we do with money more than anything in your life, else in your life will demonstrate your self-dependence or your God-dependence. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. God says to them, will a mere mortal rob God? Remember in Nehemiah that said, we're going to give to the temple our tithe. I'll explain that in a moment. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you, God. In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, God. You don't hear that anywhere else, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. As one preacher puts it, this is one of the clearest explanations in Scripture of how God feels about what Christians call the tithe. The first 10% of all that God gives you, you give back to him. Clearly, God doesn't ask for it because he needs it. <laughs> he has the storehouses of heaven and actually wants to use those to meet your needs, but he commands us to give it away as, as declaring our trust in him. Tithing is one of the single best indicators of whether we really trust God and whether we really are surrendering to him. Now, I'm not talking about money because we have a church problem with money. By God's grace, things are well. I'm talking about money because Jesus talks about it more than anything else, and I preach the Bible and actually, it's the thing that wars for your God-firstness of your heart more than anything else. In fact, Jesus compared it to a God within. He said, you cannot serve both God and money. And clearly, God takes it seriously. He says to them, you are robbing me, and you can be under a curse as a result. <laughs> and now, this curse, in my experience, is simply usually this. If I hold on to money... It's because I think it can take me somewhere I want to go and I become self-determining and self-deciding and I go down this route that I think is going to satisfy me but it only leads to trouble and life begins to 
be chaotic all the time. Things always go wrong. And, and, and I wonder why, and when I read this, I think it's because has God got my heart, particularly on this issue of, of money. Now listen, we all tithe to something. Whether you've never given a penny to anything, you all tithe to something with your money. We all give our first and best to that which we think will satisfy us. What's the first line on your budget? Mortgage, okay, because we think having a house will give us security and give us a future. First holiday budget line, because we think going away and enjoying the sun and all, having all of that will ultimately be the best thing for us. Now, those things are good. Invest in them. By God's grace, we're able to do that. But we all tithe to something. We give our first and our best, whether it's our time, particularly here, our money. Uh, there's a story of these uh, guys, a couple, new believers in Jesus, and um, they were reading their Bible, and it was all this new life to them, and it was plain as day to them that they knew they had to give God their first and their best in every way, including their money. But they went to their pastor, and they said, but, 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 but Frank, let's, give, let's call him Frank, um, but I, 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 we're just not sure we can do this. But what if, what, if, what if we struggle at the end of the month? So Pastor Frank says to them, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you write a check, give it to me, and I won't bank it. I'll put it in the drawer of my desk, and I won't bank it. And if at the end of the month you're in need, come to me. Kind of like a test, isn't it? Probably like you, I'm thinking, great wisdom, don't you think? Great. But the pastor turns around and says, and so these people are like, yes, great, good idea. And he says, shame on you. I'm like, I, thought it was, I thought it was quite a wise thing to do. He says, shame on you. You would trust me with your check for a whole month to not bank it, but you would not trust God to meet your needs. I didn't see the second part coming when I heard the story. You would trust me to think, if you have your needs, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to give you your check back. You put, you, I will say I'm giving it aside, but if I, no, no, no. But you fail to trust God with it. And this is written to people before Jesus comes. Now they had hundreds and hundreds of years of faithfulness of God providing their needs day to day, week to week, month to month. They had hundreds of years of faithfulness. They had every single reason to trust God. And you and I live this side of the cross of Jesus Christ and we can see that God gave his first and his best and held nothing back. We have all the more reason to trust God than they did. And yet we're like, this couple, I'll trust something else. Believe me, I've re-looked at my budget with the year coming ahead. And guess what's the first thing I thought might need to change? My tithe. And then I was preaching on this. <laughs> might need to think about that again, Jesus. That's okay. I... Some of you will need to change things in the coming weeks and months, okay? And, and that's fine. But don't, let's not fudge this. Some people say, I'll tithe my time instead of my money. No. You give your first and best of your time and your money. You can't escape money, money, money in the Bible. Test me in this, God says. And see that I will not pour open the floodgates of heaven. So I don't want to preach that your life will be fine and you'll have lots of money. But neither do I want to preach you should live poor and have a sacrificial life. But there is a principle in scripture where if you give your first and best to God, you sow generously, God will bless you generously. I don't know what that will look like, but I can testify since my earliest days by the grace of God. I, I, I try to do some calculation. It, it's a crazy amount of money. Could have bought another house. With what we with a mortgage, don't worry. To what we've given to God, and I think, oh. and then I look at that which I don't often look at. Think, how has God blessed us and been faithful? I can witness to you. It could be, God will provide for your needs, even if He calls me to be part of that provision, because that's how God works sometimes. Friends provide for needs. Maybe sometimes it happens in other ways. Are you self-dependent or God-dependent on this issue? See, the, the people are disappointed with God, but he charges that despite their makeup devotion, they are self-first, not God-first, and they are self-dependent, not God-dependent. They want justice, 
because we've done all the right things. We want justice and they want evil eradicated because they want the people who are not the people of God to be dealt with so that their nation would prosper. But they have a dilemma like you and I. Who wants justice? Do we not rail when the guilty are let off the hook? Who wants eradication of evil? Who would be standing if God provided justice and the eradication of evil right now? Who would be left in the room? Where does evil lurk? Yeah. And even as I preach this, I think if I want justice in my own life, giving God first and the best. So we, we long, they long for justice and they long for evil to be eradicated and we have this dilemma. We want God to act like that, but if he did, we too would be cast aside. Justice poured out on us. But thankfully, God has a Solution. Can you say solution? Let's have a look. Malachi 4 verses 1 to 2. Some cryptic verses and I'll come to an end with this. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for those who revere my name, the Son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. 400 years later, Jesus comes on the scene in Mark chapter one and his first words in essence are repent, which means turn away from self everything and turn to God first and to God dependence. It means you have to take a step and here you have this hope. We all want the justice that this verse speaks about, but we also want the hope. And God says, if you revere my name, which is to repent and turn aside from our self ruling our lives, turn to God. And because Jesus came, you see this, a furnace, the sun is a furnace, is it not? And if you go anywhere near it, it will be burnt up, but it also warms your skin. I was in Malaga last week. The sun was lovely and warm. Yesterday wasn't too bad either, was it? But that's what a furnace does. You go, it, it, it burns up, but it also brings warmth and it brings healing. Jesus comes on the scene and he, is the, he bears the wrath of God. It's all burnt up in the furnace that Jesus experienced on the wrath so that he could rise again and be the son of righteousness that brings healing in his wings. It's called the great exchange. I exchange my sin and the justice I deserve and the evil in my heart and I give it to Jesus and he gives me his righteousness. I've exchanged it. And God, the furnace of God's wrath is put on Jesus that I deserved. And the healing son that brings warmth to the body. And I don't know what you think a well-fed calf frolicking looks like. But have you ever seen a calf come out of a cage? It's like kicking its gangly legs everywhere, rejoicing in its freedom. It's a bit weird, but it's just excited to be free. This is what life in Jesus is. When you get this, he takes it all and bears the furnace of God's wrath. And you get to frolic. I won't do it. He gets to, he get, you get to frolic like a well-fed calf. Free, unrestrained, and unrestricted. So today, will you put God first? Maybe for the very first time, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You think, I want justice. And I want evil eradicated. But when I look at my heart, I'm full of self first trampling over other people, ignoring them, unsympathetic. I'm full of self-dependence and I know I need the great exchange in my place for mercy and the healing son. If, if that's you today, I encourage you, stand up now, shout, come and find me afterwards. I wanna pray with you and you can frolic like a well-fed calf. Uh, if you're a Christian, I just as we come to finish, I wonder if um, the band could come up. There's a lot that's been said today and it can feel weighty. Talk about money and putting God first. Um, it's easy to feel guilt. Or it's easy to harden your heart and think, who's he to say that? It's harder to hear God's voice in the midst of that. What is he saying to you? So I just wonder if you close your eyes. Just be still. 
And we just take a moment, and I want you to just pray, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to do? Where do I need to repent? And this is it. When it's God speaking, it's usually uncomfortable when he's putting his finger on something. But it's accompanied with a, a hope. It's not a death-bringing guilt. It's a weighty, piercing conviction that breathes hope and life. That's how you know if it's God or not. How can you put God first with your time, with your money, with your relationships, with your future? And with your worship. This is what I'd like you to do. If you know the person next to you, just for a minute, check in if they're okay with that. I want you to just pray for them. And they'll be praying for you at the same time. You don't have to say it out loud. But I want you to pray that they would have the courage to say yes to God. And they would have the conviction to follow through. And that they would have the freedom to frolic like a young calf. Just pr pray for the person next to you if you're with them. If you're not comfortable with that, just say, no thanks, just take a minute and pray out loud. You can carry on praying, but if you're ready, let's stand together. There's no rush. Take your time. God's speaking. Just when you're ready, let's stand. Feel free. I love our worship. I love the team that preaches. I love hearing stories of faith in the workplace. I love all of that. But I yearn that people would say of us, those people really are a God-first people, whatever that would look like. So we're going to come back to worship in a moment. And um, we're not a front-first people. So if you're sitting there and you've prayed for someone, and God's put something in your heart to share with them or to encourage someone. Go to them and do that. If you would like prayer for something, please just come down to the side here and we will pray with you or grab someone you, you know. Lord Jesus, one day just you say yes if you join me as best as we know how, knowing our hearts will go round and round and We'll make resolution after resolution and have to come back and say, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the great exchange. But Lord, we say yes as best as we can.
to putting you first. We thank you that he who loses his life will gain it in Jesus. Thank you. There is no losing in the economy of God. And we say we trust you, but Lord, we step into putting God first. We will pray first as an act of dependence and an act of seeking. We will give first of our best to you and to our bosses and to our relationships and to our community and our neighborhood. We give all of that as a response to you who first gave to us. And Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may frolic like well-fed calves. Why don't you do that even now? You think that's a bit weird? Yes, it is. It's why Christians give their time every day to do this, that you and I would meet with Jesus and know a liberty that looks awkward to everyone else, but it's the joy overflowing from our hearts. Do you long for that? Invite the Holy Spirit to fill you. Lord, fill us. We long the joy of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to make known in the depths of our hearts these truths which we have spoken, that it would overflow. And all of God's people said, and then let's sing and worship Jesus together.